Hello, hello, and welcome, welcome. My name is Alex Cooper. If you haven't been in one of my classes before, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I teach the computer classes for the Columbia County Library in Evans, Georgia, uh, Harlem Library, and also Uchi Creek now, our Grove Town Library with our brand new building and everything. So very glad that you're here with me today. And today's class is Chess 101, okay? So chess has always been a little bit popular. Lately, it's grown a lot more popularity because there's been some TV shows and movies and stuff like that that it's been a little bit more prominent in. And uh, usually we do um, basically some chess classes in the library, and then we do some ch a chess tournament or so, just kind of getting to geared towards that just to have some fun. And because we are at home, staying safe and everything, we can't do our tournaments, but we can still practice. So this is a great time to go ahead and pull out the board, you know, do it digitally if you want to, play an online game, download a chess app, and play with friends or play online with other people too, to try to learn some new skills and to learn something new. So welcome, welcome. Let me go ahead and post. <laughs> Welcome to class. Very glad you're here. And our kind of goal is we're going to be doing a class kind of for all ages, mostly just focus on interest. And we're going to cover some of the basics to get you started. I'm going to have lots of fun videos to kind of share with you. And let's as we as we get folks to come and come into the classroom and everything, I'll go ahead and start um, start class. The big one is of course. Feel free to kind of post any questions that you have into the chat. Uh, hey Mac, welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. But definitely feel free to post any questions that you have. And of course, the big question I always want to start off with is how can I help? Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the classes we did this month and also some classes that we have coming up tomorrow. So this month we did some photography classes to begin with. We did a let's learn about our new ebook and digital audiobook app named Libby. And we did a few classes on cord cutting. So those cord cutting classes are still up and available. And of course we actually had split it from one class to two classes because of the big interest in cord cutting and want to know more about antennas and also wanting to know more about the streaming services. So we also did a Google Suite class, which is on the Grovetown Facebook page, and we did a bunch of gadget help classes too. Join me tomorrow in my kitchen. <laughs> I will be doing a live demonstration of using the Instapot on uh, Facebook Grovetown page at 11 o'clock. And of course, join me at tw uh, 28th, uh, which is tomorrow as well, at 2.30 for the Air Fryer on the Columbia County Library Facebook page. So come join me for that then. Just a little side note, if you're looking for some great free ebooks and digital audiobooks, all you need to do is download the Libby app. Don't search for Columbia County Library or Harlem or uh, Grove Town. Search for Greater Clarksville Regional Library System when it says what your library is. Click on Georgia Download Destination and enter your library card number, okay? Then you should be good to go. On a side note, our libraries are open with limited services and hours. Curbside Holds Pickup is available. You can go to gchrl.org for details or call in the library with questions Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. I always like saying it that way, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. All right, so let's go back. Click the wrong thing for a second. <laughs> go back, and I'll come back as well. So if you want to, go ahead in the chat, kind of discuss 
kind of what your skill level is, how long, how long you played chess, how much chess have you played before, and I will go ahead and get my postings in there. I've got two handouts I want to post into the chat. Say it. <laughs> and I've got one little kind of cheat sheet. Yeah, let me post that. I'll be going over that as well. And it's loading. All right. And you can download that. And we also have our So welcome, welcome to our chess class. Very glad to have you here today. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So I've got a handout. Let me walk through our handout a little bit that I just posted. So it's a little bit of a cheat sheet and it kind of goes over. It's a good thing to actually have handy uh, to cover. It will cover some of the Basics that we're going to talk about today, of course, setting up a chess board. We're going to talk a little bit about the history. We'll talk, also talk about the moves of the chess pieces. Understanding uh, check, checkmate and stalemate in chess. And then some other stuff, and we'll kind of get to that in a minute. So, let's go right ahead. And let's talk about our history a little bit. Got the sun coming in. Shining on me a little bit. That's funny. Uh, so I guess it's not rainy as much anymore now the sun has come out. So let's do a little bit of an overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about our history of chess, a, a game of planning and strategy, the benefits of playing chess, sportsmanship and chess etiquette, game pieces and movement, how to set up a chess board, special rules, en passant capture, We'll talk about castling, the algebraic system of chess notation. We'll go into that briefly, okay? Strategies, and of course, we'll talk about checkmate in one. So checkmate in one will allow us to kind of uh, expand our skills a little bit in chess and also be able to kind of show off a little bit too. All right, so let's go ahead and let's start talking about our history a little bit. And I'll disappear so I'm not covering up the screen. The history of chess spans some 1500 years. Chess traveled, the earliest version of the game originated in India from the 6th, sixth, sixth, um, excuse me, century AD from India. The game spread to Persia. Then the Arabs conquered Persia. Chess was taken up by the Muslim world and subsequently spread to Southern Europe. In Europe, chess evolved into the current form in the 15th century. The game as played during the middle, uh, early Middle Ages was slow with many games lasting for days. Some variations and rules began to change the shape of the game by 1300 AD. A notable but initially unpopular change was the ability of the pawn to move two places in the first move instead of one. Okay, so there's a few things that if you, let's say you have never played chess before, I feel like can hold you back from knowing what to do just by starting out. And that's one of them. So we'll be talking about our pawn moving can move one space or it can move two in its first move. The queen and bishop remain relatively weak um, until 
between 1475 and 51500 in either Spain, Portugal, France, or Italy, the queens and bishops' modern move started and spread, making chess close to the modern form today. In Europe, some of the pieces gradually got new names. Queen, bishop, pawn, king. In the 1850s, modern chess tournament play began. First World Chess Championship was held in 1886. The 1900s saw establishment of the World Chess Federation. Okay. In the 1970s, computers for analysis. First program chess game on the market. 1995, big thing was online gaming appeared. Okay. It is considered a game of strategy and planning because during the game you play, you plan and do certain strategies based on the position elements of the pieces. These include pawn structure, king safety, piece placement, and mobility. However, the answer is not quite as simple as saying that chess involves strategy and planning. The thing to notice is that chess does not involve what? chance. All of your theoret um, <laughs> theological possible, po um, possible next moves and your opponent's possible next moves that are known, defined, and visible to both players affects your strategy and planning. The further ahead your brain can plan, the stronger you can become a, as a player. A player with better, with better planning and strategy will always win. Some games depend on chance. Card games, what cards you will draw in Gin Rummy, for example. Board games like Monopoly. Who loves Monopoly? I love Monopoly. But it does have a, some chance because it's a roll of the dice. Okay. Board games like Monopoly, where the outcome depends in part on the roll of the dice. These games, luck will enable a player to win a game, even if this planning and strategy are not as good as his opponents. This is not true for chess. Here's a short list of just some of the benefits of learning and playing chess. Provides practice at making accurate and fast decisions under time pressure, drills, skills that can help improve exam scores, improves reading, pattern recognition enhanced, teaches sportsmanship, dealing with difficult choices, making the best choice from a group of good choices, teaches to learn from mistakes. Responsibility for actions, Concentration is vigorously practiced. Logical reasoning is sharpened. Measurable individual accomplishments are enjoyed. Critical thinking, memory is enhanced. Uh, problem solving and what if skills. Intellectual maturity is fostered. Belonging to a good crowd, self esteem, mind enrichment, mental exercise, ana um, analyzing actions and, and consequences and the importance of planning. So let's talk about our sportsmanship. Be polite and get off to a good start. Don't boast, trash talk, or try to intimidate your opponent. Don't argue with your opponent. Don't give or ask for advice. Don't be annoying. I know. Don't try to trick your opponent to pretend to have made a bad move. Do not rush your opponent. After your game, be a good winner or loser because the big thing is uh, we try to, our game has to end so we can start a new game. Okay. Saying check, big question is, is check required um, to always say? So if you're about to win and capture the other player's king, do you always have to say check? No, it is not required, but it is polite to say you're in check, okay? 
Let's talk about our game pieces and movement. Ah, okay. Okay, hold on, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now's a good time to pull your board out if you're going to fall along. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so let's talk about our pieces. The big one is how to win, okay? So the goal is kind of to win, isn't it? How to win, checkmate or trap the opponent's king, okay? How to start, the white side always goes first. At the start, choose who will play uh, the whites, okay? How to uh, so a big one is uh, you can either turn or you can roll or excuse me spin. One player could be chosen to spin a piece to decide who goes first, whichever one it points to. Another one is kind of fun is to do the classic rock paper scissors and to see who wins and that's who this is the white because the white goes first. Okay, how to capture land on a square occupied by one of the other pieces. Okay, so let's talk about our different pieces. So first we have our king, okay? The importance of the king is the most important piece. It's movement, it can move one square at a time in any direction, okay? Up, down, left, right. And I also have that, let me pull up your the cheat sheet real quick. So our cheat sheet, Kind of talks about the movement of all our pieces if you want to have that in hand fall along what is check okay check is when the king is placed in jeopardy of being captured okay he can only move one square okay what to do when in check the king must be moved out of check or the attacking piece blocked by another piece okay so if there was a piece if you can move a piece to block um, the king being in danger then you can do that but you always have to move or you always have to move the king if it's in check okay what is checkmate the king is in check and cannot move to a safe square and the danger cannot be blocked or the checking piece captured, then game is over. Okay. How can you tell if the king what the king's piece is? Look for the cross on the top. Okay. Let's talk about the rook, or someone might say the castle. Okay. Movement can move one or multiple squares in a straight line in any direction. So kind of like a cross, up, down, left, right. How many? There are two per side for a total of four on the board. The placement, it occupies the four corners of the board. There are, okay, so knights. Knights are kind of the most tricky one to kind of figure out how they move, okay? The knight has the most complicated move. It's like an L, okay? Now, you can either do it two ways. My brain usually goes two squares left or right, okay? You can do um, one where, so two squares left to right, and then there's also the one where you do one move yeah, and then two squares. So either which way you want to do it, 
I usually do two squares left to right, two squares left to right, okay? So there's two ways of doing that, but two squares left to right is the easiest way to do. Uh, some people actually consider the knight to be the sniper of, of the, the chessboard because it can actually jump over other pieces. It can move one square straight and one square diagonal in any direction, okay? Only piece which can move around another piece. So they basically say it can jump over other pieces, okay? How many? There are two knights per side, four knights per chess set. It's the knight or the horse. <laughs> Placement. The knight occupies the square right next to the rook in the back row. So the rooks are on the outside. The knights go right here, okay? talk about the bishop. The bishop can move one or multiple squares in any diagonal, diagon alley, that's right, diagonal direction. <laughs> How many? Bishops also number two per side, okay? And bishops also number two per side. Why is there an and there? I'm not sure. Let's see. There you go. Here's your answer. Uh, bishops also number two per side. How many? Placement. These are located right next to the knight in the back row. Okay. So third over. So right here. Okay. There are the only pieces which occupy only one color square during the entire game. So basically they are pieces that, um, how can I say that, uh, there's certain pieces that can never attack, okay? Because it only occupies one color. And we have our queen, okay? So how important is the queen piece? <laughs> The most powerful piece on the board, okay? The movement is crazy, okay? it can, She can move up, down, left, right, diagonal, um, either way. So basically, it's kind of like she is a, a morph of the rook and the bishop, okay? So up, down. And then, of course, up, down, left, right, and then diagonal, okay? How many? Each player has one. Ah. And then someone usually says in class, I've heard you can have more than one queen. It's like, yep, we're going to talk about that. The queen is located to the right of the, the king at the beginning of the game, okay? Located to the right of the king. What about the pawn? Eh, importance of the pawn. It's the weakest piece, okay? Movement can only move forward one square at a time, but it's but on its initial move, meaning its first move, it may move two squares, okay? So if it's here, it can move two, okay? But anytime it's any place else, it can only move one. Now, how does it how does a pawn capture? Well, a pawn could only capture diagonally, okay? So if there's a piece here, then he can diagonal jump there to capture. Piece here, jump there to capture. Other than that, cannot. Cannot move forward and capture a piece. It cannot move backwards, okay? Captures only diagonally. How many? There are eight pawns on each side, placement, Entire second row of the board is occupied by pawns. Now get this. This is the thing where someone earlier said, uh, but I thought you could have more than one queen. Well, you can with a pawn promotion. So basically, if a pawn uh, advances a pawn to the opponent's last row on the square, it can be promoted to a piece of any rank except a king ab above it, including the queen. Even if you already have one queen on the board, you can have more than one. 
So here's your pawn here. Let's say your pawn jumps, 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 and makes it here to this back row. It can be promoted. Now you can choose any piece except for the king, but the most powerful piece would be to get another queen. So that's why people really think it's really the queen promotion, but you can choose bishop or you can choose rook if you want to, but it's a lot easier just to choose the queen, okay? And that's the only piece that can do that. Just the pawn moving there, moves here, can become a queen, okay? So we talked about our movement. Let's talk about our placement of our board. A big one here is the king and the queen mirror each other. Do you see? So we have the black and we also have the white. And you see that the king and the queen, they mirror each other, okay? Usually when you're setting up the board, you're kind of thinking about the white side uh, setting up because that's the way the people are gonna go. The big one here is to also think about, and the funny thing is you'll see on movies, TV shows, stuff like that, they'll have a great chess board set up, but then when you actually look at it, you have to realize that the other rule of setting up a board is the light square, the light goes on the right, okay? So this square here needs to be light on the right, okay? So just try to remember that, light on the right. Some people will say the, the dark on the left, which is fine, but light on the right kind of goes together. Here's kind of a more of what they look like here queen, king right here, and remember they mirror each other, okay? Okay, so let me show. So let's talk about some of our more advanced strategies here. I also have it on the handout. So let me go back to our handout here. Let's have our pieces. We talked about stay on checkmate. Stalemate basically just means that you, stalemate is the relatively rare situation where a player whose king isn't in check, has no legal moves to make, Stalemate is considered a draw. Neither player wins, but the game is over. Okay, and it can happen. Again, you can you can set up kind of any rules if you're just playing somebody else for fun. In our class, we try to set it, all the rules up towards getting towards our um, our goal of doing a tournament. but you can come up with some fun rules if you wanted to. A big one is maybe even set it up just to have a timer um, going on for the whole game, because maybe you say you only want to play a 30 minute game and there you go right there and who has the, the, um, the most pieces on the board can win. That could be a, just a simple house rule if you wanted to, or you get to the point that there can only be so many um, moves. So now let's talk about two of our I won't say advanced because these are two things you need to know when even when you first start playing chess. En passant and castling. Okay. So repeat after me. En passant. That's right. En passant. So let's talk about en passant. En passant is French. It's, it captures. It means... Um, in pass in passing is a special pawn capture which can occur immediately after player moves a pawn two spaces forward from its standing position and an enemy pawn could have captured it had it moved only one square forward so since we are, our pawn can actually move two squares it gives us a little bit of a problem because um, if you could move two squares and since that's the pawn's first move, it could jump two squares and maybe that would pass, get it out of trouble. That's not the way that works. The opponent captures the just move pawn as if taking it as in passes, 
as it passes through the first square, okay? In passing is kind of what it, it, people say it usually means. The resulting position is the same as if the pawn had moved only one square forward and the enemy pawn had captured, okay? So let's look at our example here. The en passant capture must be done on the very next turn or the right to do so is lost. Now, usually in class, I have a really big chess board on the ground and I basically will take volunteers when we do stuff like this, someone to come up and then they basically move the pieces and then of course we talk about it and stuff. Setting up our board, moving our pieces. So such a move is the only occasion in chess which a piece captures but does not move to the square of the cap uh, the captured piece, okay? En passant. So here's our piece, instead of moving our pawn moving one, if it moves two, instead this piece says, oh, I captured you because you were here, and it moves down just like if you had moved once. But what's our big thing? It has to be in the next turn or you lose the right to do so. Okay. Whoop. All right, so I've got a little video. We're going to have a, a chess master talk to us about this. Hello, future chess players. This is Now, I do realize I'm also going to pause the video so that I can ask questions as well. Okay, so be be ready. Hello, future chess players. This is International Master David Proust for Chess.com. And today I will be teaching you one of the exception rules in chess, which is capturing en passant. And en passant is Francais for in passing. And it is the one capture in chess where your piece does not end up on the square of the piece it captured. Usually in chess, if you were going to capture a piece, you would pick up a piece of yours that was going to do the capture. You would pick up a piece of the opponent's that you were going to capture, and then you would put your piece down where that piece had been. And that's how all captures work, basically. is just you walk onto the square where the other piece was, and then you remove it. But en passant is the one exception to that and it is a special move where the other person's pawn moves two spaces like this and then you capture their pawn with the pawn next to it as if they had only moved one square so it looks like this now let me take you back in chess history a little bit and explain to you where this move comes from to help you remember it and then we'll just go over it a couple more times so chess used to have a rule that pawns could move one space at a time. Now they can move two spaces if they are on the second rank or the seventh rank, right? So it used to be pawns could move one step at a time. And so what you would see is you would see the pawns moving like this slowly towards each other. And then finally they'd come into contact. And now these two pawns, either one could capture the other and the battle starts. Well, at some point, people's attention spans really decreased. And they decided that they couldn't wait this long to start the battle, right? So they added the rule that pawns could move two steps at a time. But a very, very important thing about pawns is whether they're past pawns or not past pawns. So it's a very important question whether this pawn here could walk all the way down to the board and become a queen with this pawn never being able to capture it? That's a very, very important question if you have any way to get past this pawn. So theoretically, you shouldn't have any way to get past it. See, no matter how I move the white or black pawns, at some point, there comes a move where they could capture each other, right? If I move them two steps at a time, there still comes a point where they could capture each other. So these are not past pawns. They're pawns which still have an opposing pawn that could get them. So that brings us to this guy over here. Is he a past pawn? No, there is a pawn on the neighboring file, and he should not be able to walk all the way down the board and become a queen without this pawn having the chance to capture him on his trip. But let's say he makes this move. How is this pawn supposed to capture him, right? He's Legally, this pawn's only supposed to capture on these two squares. So did this guy just run right past him? Ah, can he? 
Yes or no? Ah. So they decided that that would mess up the way chess played too much. So instead of allowing the pawn to run past like that, they decided to create an extra rule, which is to capture in passing. So when a pawn passes you by, you can capture it by moving as if it had only gone one step. Now, this option is only available for one move. You don't have the option to capture on a3 for the rest of the game. You can't like move your king, and their pawn keeps going, and you're doing something with your king attacking this pawn, and they come here, and suddenly you realize that this pawn is going to become a queen, so you move your pawn to a3 and say, I capture your pawn in passing. Absolutely not. You can't even do that if their pawn remains on a4, and they now move their king. You can't suddenly realize, wait, I should capture their pawn. It's a one-time option, okay? So it's just saying the pawn can't go past you without you having the right to capture it for a moment, but if you won't take that right, if you won't exercise it, it's taken away from you, like so many other rights. So uh, the pawn, if it goes past you, you've got a one-move window in which you can capture it behind like this. All right, so now let me ask you a question. Let's say this pawn here and this pawn. Can this pawn capture that pawn passant by going to the d4 square, yes or no? Ah. Look where the, pawn, the pawns are. Would that be their first move? The answer is no. This pawn here is not a pawn that has just moved two spaces, right? In fact, all captures en passant must occur with a pawn that has just gone from the second rank to the fourth rank, right? And the pawn that captures it has to be on the fifth rank and then take it, okay? So how about this? Black plays this move. Can white capture this pawn en passant? Okay. What do you think? If you answered yes, you now understand how to capture en passant. Ah. And I'm very happy for you. Okay, so one more quick question just to check on your full understanding. So black has a pawn on c4, and now white moves their pawn from d3 to d4. Is black allowed to capture that pawn en passant because the pawn is on the right rank, and the white pawn is now on the right rank as well? Can black capture it like this? The answer is no, because this pawn has only moved one step. En passant is only when that pawn rushes past you by moving two steps, not when it moves one. Very good. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you around on chess.com. All right, so we had a chess master come talk to us, tell us about en passant. So let's go ahead and let's talk about our next rule that we really need to know, and that is castling, okay? Happy to say after en passant, en passant and then the double uh, space and knowing the, the pieces and how, how basically capture works, you'll pretty much have everything you need to know uh, to be able to play. So castling can only occur if there are no pieces standing between the king and the rook. Okay, Neither king nor the rook uh, to be castled with may have moved from its original position, okay? There can be no opposing pieces that could possibly capture the king in his original square. The square he moves through or the square that he ends, uh, ends the turn. The king moves two squares towards the rook he intended, intends to castle with. This may be either rook, okay? The rook when moves, the rook then moves to the square through which the king passes. Okay, this is all one move. It's a little bit. It's easier to to do castling on the right, but if on white, if you're black, it's easier to do it on the left. Okay. So basically, this is all one move. You would move your rook and your knight, and then in one move, move your king move the rook right there, and then they're like this, okay? Opposite side, 
king moves, uh, you'd have to move your queen, your your rook. I mean, you move your queen. Did I say rook a minute ago? I meant bishop, I'm sorry. Uh, you need to move your queen, the bishop, and the knight to be able to do that. And then it's all one move here and then move there, okay? Can be done, not as easy. Now, here's a big one. It has to be the king and the rook's first move. All right, sorry. And I, so let's look at our handout. So here's our castling. Must be the king's first move, and it also must be the rook's first move as well. Okay. All right. Any questions about that? I'm going to show you a little video about that. We're going to have our chess master come back and talk to us about how to castle. I will be pausing it for a question, so be, be ready. Hey everybody, International Master David Proust here for Chess.com and today we're just going to go over a really important special move in chess. There aren't too many of these. Um, there is En Passant, which is a special way to capture with pawns. Another video covers that. And there is Castling, which is really a very, very valuable move, so good to know, which is a way that you can sort of reverse the position of your king and your rook. So. Castling is useful because usually your king will be in some danger in the center of the board and your rooks will be somewhat useless outside of the center of the board. So you'll want to sort of reverse that situation. You're allowed to make this move only if there's no piece in between your king and rook. And you can do it towards the king side or towards the queen side. Now, the basic rule for castling is you move your king two steps towards the rook and put the rook on the other side of your king. So, for example we would move this king to g1 and then the rook jumps to f1 or if we do it in the other direction again you move two spaces even though you won't end up at the same spot and the rook hops to the other side of the king always the rook ends up next to your king okay so black will also castle queenside moves his king two steps and the rook comes to the other side of his king okay so that's the basic rule of castling that's what it looks like when you castle now there are a couple side rules to realize. In addition to not having anything in between your king and rook, you need to not violate certain rules about check, which is when your king is attacked. Okay, So let's say that black played this checking move with the queen. White is not allowed to castle when their king is in check. So this is not a legal way to escape from check, to move your king two spaces to g1 you would now have to move your king to avoid this check. Okay. Now, second rule about castling. You cannot castle through check. So since black controls the F1 square, white is not allowed to castle kingside here, though he could castle queenside. And the final rule is that you can't castle onto a square where you would be in check. So here the black queen has moved, so she's covering c1. That means white cannot castle queenside. That would be illegal to put your king in check. Okay, so three rules for when you cannot castle. You can't castle when you are in check. You can't castle through check. And you can't castle into check. Okay? And, <laughs> sorry, but there's more. You are not allowed to castle if you have already moved your king or your rook. So remember when black checked the white king, this would actually, in this case, since white can't block or capture the queen, this would prevent white from ever castling. Because now the white king has moved, so he's no longer allowed to castle. So black checks the white king again, the white king moves, and now black castles to get their rooks into the game. Now is white allowed to castle either side? Ah. What do you think, yes or no? The answer is no, because the king has already moved. All right. Now, here's another example. Let's go back to the beginning here. I'll play h3 for white. Black plays queen takes b2, attacking this rook, and I move the rook to save it. Now, black castles. Am I allowed to castle kingside now, even though I've moved this rook? 
I can because this is not the rook that I'm castling with. So I can castle kingside. But let's say instead of castling, black had retreated his queen. And I moved my rook back here, and now black castled. Would I be allowed to castle queenside? Absolutely not, because this rook has moved. Okay, so I can't castle queenside, but I can castle kingside. But one restriction which does not apply, just to be clear, is this. If black plays this move, attacking the rook, is white allowed to castle queenside? This is from my starting position. So the king hasn't moved. The king is not in check. The rook hasn't moved. The rook is attacked. The answer is I can castle queenside, see, because I never put my king on a square that was attacked by the black queen. So it is legal to castle when your rook is attacked, but not once you've moved your rook. And those are the rules for castling. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you around on chess.com. There you go. Okay, so you think you grasped that concept? I hope so. It's a good idea to castle. We'll also have some other, I guess you'll say special guests that will encourage you to do castling. Um, even in class, usually after we've learned this, I encourage the students to say, okay, now make sure everybody castles in this, in this round. And so you kind of get the concept. You also realize that the big deal about castling is you want to get your king um, basically out of play. Uh, pushing it either over to the right or to the left um, so that it's a little bit harder to basically, um, I guess you'd say, attack. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's talk about our algebraic notation system. Now, the reason we cover this is because this is something that you'll actually see. You see you'll see this in movies, TV shows, stuff like that. They'll say, night knight to b6 and you're like well what does that mean um so so here we are we're going to talk about this kind of briefly there you go it's the way the standard form of talking about how games of chess ha will have happened you don't have to know this specifically but it's really good there are some tournament plays or if you're trying to get let's say a merit badge in chess you will have to learn this um the notation The biggest thing about this is just know that they're vertical rows called files and the horizontal rows are called ranks. As far as my background is, is in Excel, you'll actually hear me say columns or rows. <laughs> but they call them vertical rows or horizontal rows, columns or rows. Uh, so I really, instead of saying that, I should say files. But anyway. So they're break, broken up like this, and then in class we'd actually have a big board out with our big, big chess pieces and stuff. And basically what we would do is have that laid out on the floor, and then in a little bit when we do our match in one, we'd act, in one move we'd actually have that all set up and everything. So thus let's talk about that. So you can see on the board, uh, you see the light square is on the right, so light on the right um, allows you to set it up properly. You may have a board that has the ABC and the number one, two, three, always number on the left side, as you can see there. So basically, for example, the white knight starts the game on the square E1, okay? While the black knight is on B, eight okay huh for example the white knight starts in the game on square on e why does it say e1 all right hang on a second i think i need to fix that it should say b <laughs> There we go. Every class we're constantly ch updating and changing, of course. Example, the white knight starts the game on square B1 and the black knight on B2. 
8. Can move to open square a6. So let's look at a6. Okay. So down and to the left. Or c6. Okay. c6. So the black knight can move down and go to the left or the right. So let's talk about our different pieces. Each type of piece or the pawns is identified by an uppercase letter using the first letter and the name of the piece in whatever language is spoken by the player uh, recording. <laughs> pawns are not indicated uh, by a letter, but rather by the absence of any letter, it is not necessary to distinguish between pawns for moves since only one pawn can move to a given square, okay? So basically, if K to A8, that would be knight. What about Q to A8? Yeah, that'd be queen. Now, knight and king have the same first letter, so what letter do we use? We use N for knight, okay? Bishop is B, rook is R, and pawn has nothing. So if you say A8, that means that a pawn moved there, okay? Now here's an example. Each move of piece is indicated by the piece's uppercase letter plus the coordinates of the destination square. For example, E5, black moves a pawn to E5, okay? E5. No piece letter in this case, it's a pawn moved. So knight F3, so the knight is moving to F3, a move for a knight, okay? When a piece marks a capture, an X is inserted between the piece's letters and the destination square, okay? So, for example, B, meaning bishop, captured something at C6, okay? So, X equals capture. Yeah, it's a little bit more self, maybe more, but a little bit of explanatory there. All right. When a pawn makes a capture, the file from which the pawn departed is used to identify the pawn rather than a letter representing the pawn itself. For example, E. So we have E captured D5. Okay, E captured D5. All right, en passant captures are noted by specifically specifying the captured pawn's file of the departure, the X, the destination square, not the square of the captured pawn with the suffix EP indicating en passant. So E captured D3 in en passant. All right, so let's keep moving here. Big thing is checkmate, a move which places the opponent's king in check, usually in no notes the plus sign appended checkmate at the completion of moves is notated as plus plus okay there we go d4 plus plus is checkmate notation one zero 
at the completion of the moves indicated that the white one, zero to one, indicates the black one. Okay? Let's move that down to the next line there. Ooh, a half a half equals a draw. Whoop. A little bit kind of cutting down on the wordiness of that. All right, so this is a big one here. So if you are in some kind of competition what did we just learn? This means that the black one, and it goes on down the side here. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and let's see. Where's my now that you've learned how to move to capture to check and checkmate as well as do the special moves in chess like castling and en passant, it's time for you to feel what it's like in a real game. In a real game, nobody is there to tell you what to move. You have to think and decide, what is the right move? Should I move a piece or can I capture something? Should I castle or try to promote one of my pawns? This is where the thinking part of chess comes in and you have to try and decide what your best move is. The only way to do this is by looking at the board and considering both your options and your opponent's possible plans, and then trying to decide which move improves your position the most. Sometimes the right move will jump right out at you. Rook h8, checkmate. At other times, you'll have absolutely no idea what the best move is. Let's see if you can find a good move in each of the following positions. Black is currently up three pawns, so Black decides to offer a trade of queens, thinking it will be easier to win the game without having to deal with White's queen. Black didn't consider what the queen was doing on the eighth rank. Can you find White's best move? The Black queen gave up protection of the back rank and forgot to ask what checks White has in the position. White only has one check, but it's checkmate. If you found queen e8 checkmate, great job. This checkmate is known as a back rank checkmate. In this position, after rook a1 check, it looks like black is about to deliver a back rank checkmate. What is white to do? Well, if white decides to block with rook e1, notice that doesn't help because after rook takes e1, it's checkmate. Let's look a little closer. Can you find another white piece that can help us deal with the check? If you found the move bishop takes a1, Great job. The bishop moves all the way from the other side of the board to come to the rescue, capturing the checking piece. Remember, if you can capture a checking piece, this can often be the best way to get out of check. In this position, what do you think is white's best move? If you're thinking rook a8 delivering a back rank checkmate, you have to remember it's not just your moves you have to consider. 
We also have to figure out what is our opponent doing. In this position, white's best move is also white's only move because notice white is in check. And in this position, white must deal with the check first and play king h1. Now black has to be careful and deal with white's threat on the next turn. In this position, can you find white's best move? Notice that we can capture a pawn with rook takes e4, but then black is able to do the same thing with knight takes a7. Remember, when you find a good move, always look for a better move. Don't forget about your pawn on a7. It's one move away from reaching the 8th rank. Do you remember what happens when a pawn reaches the other side of the board? That's right, the pawn gets a promotion. Notice the newly promoted queen puts the black king into check and threatens the knight all at the same time. After king f7, queen takes c6 wins the knight. It takes time and practice to find the best move. Now it's your turn to continue practicing finding the best move. So what do we learn? We learned a lot, didn't we? All right, so let's talk about our strategies of chess. There are three distinct stages to the chess game. Chess that you will need to know in order to be a winning chess player. There are three, now I, I will tell you this right now, basically what we have covered so far, you are ready to play chess, okay? So now we're kind of getting more into our strategies, coming up with stuff in the future, got some other videos, and then we're also gonna include our captures in one as well. And then, but if you did just wanna start playing, that's perfectly fine and come back to this video later uh, for some more strategies. So this is a little bit of our Chess 101 class and also our Chess 2 strategies class kind of at the same time. So uh, usually in uh, chess class, since we'd have a Chess 1 and 2, we'd actually break up the last 30 to 45 minutes so that people could just play some chess together, okay? So there are three distinct stages to the game of chess that you need to know in order to be a winning chess player. These three stages are the opening, middle, or an end game. Each stage has different goals and objectives. The opening, you want to get a rapid development of your primary pieces you also want to safeguard your king generally by castling, okay? It is in this phase of the game that you want to try and achieve dominance over the middle four squares of the board, okay? Generally, the opening lasts between 10 to 20 moves, roughly. The middle game is when you begin to coordinate your primary pieces and attack your opponents weak spots and open files. The game is to the goal of the game is to primarily uh, blah, the goal is to win primary pieces from your opponent or even be able to checkmate your opponent. The middle game is approximately from the end of the opening phase until around move 40. okay? The end game is when you use your remaining primary pieces, to take advantage of the weakness that you created in your opponent's defense during the middle game. The end game often concludes when one of the players is able to move a pawn to the other side of the board and thus turn the pawn um, in for a queen. This is then followed by a checkmate or a resignation strategy, not tactics, are what need to be considered in the end game. Classical opening principles. The four major aspects of classical opening principles are centralization, quick development, early castling, and knights before bishops. So move your knights before bishops. Centralization, the most important part in the chessboard is the center. Pieces placed in the center attack more squares than those positioned in the sides of the board. The knight placed at d4 can effectively attack eight squares. There are, I won't list those, 
the same knight in h1 can attack only two squares. So basically, remember, putting, put, try to put your pieces in the middle. If you do not control or possess a fair share of the center, then it might be difficult to maneuver pieces from one side of the board to the other side of the board. Quick development. The second important part of classical opening principles is quick development. You might know that pawns are of the lowest uh, cadre, I guess. They're the lowest. <laughs> the minor pieces, such as bishops and knights, are the next uh, cadre. The, the queen and the rooks are the major pieces in the chessboard. The ultimate superior is, of course, our king. According to classical principles, developing minor pieces is considered important before developing major pieces such as rooks and queens. But remember, knights before bishops. It should be ensured that pawn movements are restricted to the minimum. The knights can jump over other pieces in the board, and as such, pawn movement is not necessary for developing the knights. If you open up the pawns, in front of the king and the queen, then the two bishops are open up and so are the king and the queen. Yep. Castling is one of the special moves in chess where the knight is allowed to move two squares in a single move. In addition, two pieces are moved in single move, the knight and the rook. And we discussed castling already. The two rooks are in the two corners. Let's see, now pieces are... Knights before bishops. Another part of the classical opening principles is to move the knights before bishops. This always, as already stated, the knights can be moved without want, waiting for the pawns to leave way as they are capable of jumping over other pieces lying in between the original square and destination square of the knight. As such, it is suggested that knights are moved into the front before opening up the bishops. It talks about the different mates. Let me go ahead and talk about opening strategies. Hi, my name is Rebecca Taxman and I'm with Chess NYC. And I'm going to talk to you today about the three principles to opening strategy. So when we get to the game, we're always like, Ugh, what do I do? There's so many pieces. I don't know how to start. Well, I'm going to give you three steps that are going to help you create a strong, confident opening. First thing that we need to understand is these four center squares. These are considered our super squares because this is where the center of the board is, the control center. For example, if I have my knight in the center of the board, my knight can control up to eight different squares. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight we can see that this is a very strong place for my knight. If I have my knight on the side of the board, it can only control up to four squares. One, two, three, four. Therefore, my knight is stronger in the center, whereas most pieces are stronger in the center of the board. So, at the beginning of the game, we want to think about center control. First thing we can do is try and get our pawns into the center very important to try and get our pawns to control the center. The next important step that we want to focus on is piece development. Now, I like to think about my pieces as they are working for me. I want to give my pieces a job. If they're sitting back here, they're not happy and they're not doing anything. So, my next step is to bring my pieces out and have them working for me. Usually, we bring up the knights before the bishops. So, I can bring my knight to f3 and my other knight to c3 and then I'm bringing them towards the center. Notice how I did not bring my knight to h3. That would not be a good choice. Towards the center. Next, I wanna bring my bishops out. Again, towards the center, controlling the center squares. The next step that we always wanna consider is king safety. Very important. I like to consider the king like a baby. The reason I consider the king a baby is because we always wanna protect our babies just like we always want to protect our king. Therefore, the best way to protect our king in the beginning of the game is to castle. 
Now we have two places, two ways that we can castle. We can either castle on the king side or on the queen side. Right away, I can see that I can castle on the king side. To castle, I move my king two spaces and then bring my rook to the other side. And now my king is stuck behind a little fortress or to keep with the theme of a baby, a crib, and it is protected and safe. Just to review, the three important principles are controlling the center, peace development, and king safety. Those are the three things that we can do at the beginning of the game to go into the middle game confidently. All right, so we'll kind of skip over a little bit of the different kind of mates. And I'm actually gonna show you the classic kind of draw in chess. Big one is the game ends in a draw if any of these conditions occur. The game is automatically a draw if the player to move is not in check but has no legal move. This situation is called a stalemate. An example of such a position is shown in the diagram to the right. The game is immediately draw when there is no possibility of checkmate for either side with any series of legal moves. This draw is, very, is often due to insignificant material, including the end game. King against king, because a king cannot capture another king, because a king, if it tried to move to capture, it would put itself in check. King against king and bishop. King against king and knight. King and bishop against king and bishop, or both bishops on di um, diagonals, um, di uh, uh, diagonal, diagonals, the same color. Okay. The game ends in a draw if any of these conditions occur. Both players agree to a draw after one of the players makes such an offer. The player having the move may claim a draw by declaring that one of the following conditions exist or by declaring an intention to make a move which will bring about one of these conditions. 50 move rule. There has been no capture upon or move in the last 50 moves by each player. Threefold repetition. The, play, the same board position has occurred three times with the same player to move and all pieces have the same rights to move around. Let's talk about exploiting weaknesses. Chess requires that you look for weaknesses in your opponent's positions while keeping ourselves out of weak positions. As always, the game remains a balance of attacking and defending. The weakness is simply a flaw in a position that we can exploit. These weaknesses can be Anything from an open line to poor piece placement to overworked pieces. Depending on what stage we are at, the game will be will, will see, depending on what stage we are at, the game we will see different weaknesses in our opponent. Force, a reoccurring aim of chess strategy is to force your opponent to choose between a bad scenario and a downright unpleasant one. Having to choose between saving a queen or a rook or forcing your opponent to move out of check and sacrificing a piece as a result. Uh, let me see. Okay, so... I'm going to show you the fastest checkmates in chess. Chess can often be a long game with more than 100 moves played, but it can also be incredibly short if you want it to be. Many people want to know, what are the fastest checkmates? And we are going to show you, but keep in mind, none of these checkmates can be forced. These are only checkmates that you literally have to try to do on purpose because they can be otherwise defended very easily. Let's see the shortest possible checkmate on the board. White plays f3, not a great opening move, already exposing the king on the e1 to h4 diagonal. Black opens with e5, 
notice the black queen is already looking at the weakened h4 square, ready to pay the white king a visit. White plays g4, further weakening the e1 to h4 diagonal, and the black queen pounces on the h4 square, delivering the fastest checkmate in chess. Notice that the white king cannot move, there's no way to block the check, and you can't capture the checking piece, so after two moves, the game is already over. In fact, it's time to start a new game. Let's see that idea again, but this time it'll be white delivering the checkmate. After e4, black plays f6, d4, g5. And can you spot the checkmate? That's right, queen h5, the fastest checkmate for white is in three moves, and the fastest checkmate for black is in just two moves. Let's hope that you never find yourself on the wrong side of this checkmate. Now it's your turn to practice the fastest checkmates. So, that's the fastest checkmate. All right, so let's go ahead. If you do have a board with you, I kind of recommend you kind of setting the board up like this, and I'll just give you a minute to kind of decide what you think it should, what it is going to be. Um, so basically this game is we are the white and we are trying to capture or, or you know, uh, put in check, checkmate in one move. Usually what would happen in class is I usually have it set up on a big board. Have it set up, I'd have my big board, I'd have volunteers to come down to kind of set the board up and then we get everybody kind of a chance to kind of guess what they think it is and kind of go around uh, the room and stuff. So here's our mate in one. So what do you think? Remember it's one move. So let's look at our pieces. Okay. Well, could our rook do it? Let's see, what if our rook moved here? Ah, well the king could actually capture the rook, couldn't he? Yep, he sure could. All right, what about our pawn? Because our pawn is our pawn's first move, so it could move here. Won't be the pawn. What about our bishop? What could our bishop do? Well, could our bishop be in danger if he moved to F6? No, actually not. So if our bishop moved here, that means our, and we actually know where our rook is, our king could not move here because that would put it in danger. That would be checkmate. So the answer is bishop to f6 for checkmate. All right, so let's go on to number two. Remember, we're the white. We're trying to get the black in check. And give you a second to look at it. All right, so let's see. So if our rook came and captured the black bishop, what could happen? Well, the king could then capture our rook, couldn't it? So that wouldn't put our king in check. Could this king do anything? No. So basically it means that the, this king can't really move anywhere because if it moves here or here, it would put itself in check. So what could we do? What about our bishop? What if our bishop moved down here? No, that wouldn't really work out, would it? No. I'll give you a big hint. You have to move a piece because it's blocking. You got it? Right, it's the pawn that needs to be moved. If I moved the pawn and captured this um, rook right here, or I could actually move the pawn up, but then it would be captured by the rook. But if I capture the rook, that means the bishop would actually have a clear shot all the way up to the king. So do realize, think about moving a piece that could be blocking another piece, not just moving your piece. 
So because this is a pawn and it was on C, it's labeled C captured. And then it says the bishop to B4 Oh, duh. <laughs> it's not saying anything about the bishop. Okay, so it's captured to b4. Okay, and then it's saying that the, the king is in check. All right. Let's look at this one. We have more pieces on the board now, don't we? Let's spend our time looking at it. All right, so where's our king? Here's our king here we're gonna capture. Let's see, what if we moved, this is not his first move, so we could actually move it just one. What about the knight? No. What about the rook? Could capture that, but then he would be captured. Remember, this is all one move. Let's see. Any pieces over here that make it do anything big? What about moving this piece to here? Then it would be captured. Ah, are you seeing the queen? I believe so. So if the queen went up here and captured this rook, then that king is fully in check and checkmate. The game basically is over. There you go. So queen to capture g8, okay, and then checkmate. All right, how about this one? After this, we'll do one more, and then we'll move on. All right, what you got? Let's see, what if we moved our rook? Remember, here's the black king. We're trying to capture one move. Moved our rook here. Did that work? No, because the king could capture us then. Uh, what if we moved our king, our, our, our rook here? No, then the, knight, the king could just move one step to the left. That wouldn't work. Let's see, how can we finish this off in one move? Could our king do anything in one move? No. Hmm. So if I put our king here, we could technically, but guess what? The rook's here, so we can't do that because you can't put your own, you can't move your king to put him in check. Now what about the pawn at the top? Ah, let's think about it. So we actually have our pawn at the top. And if we actually go up here and we say, well, what if our pawn ah, went to the last row there so it could actually be promoted to being a queen? Now, believe it or not, this actually has two answers. So if I made him the queen, the queen can come to, then now the, it being a queen because the queen can move down and because the rook has stopped this king from moving to the left, and he can't move to the right because that rook's in the way. He is in checkmate, okay? Now, this actually has two answers because, remember, in pawn promotion, most of us, of course, would choose a queen, but you could have actually chosen a rook as well. So the rook could have actually done the exact same thing. Boom, checkmate, okay? All right, let's look at our last one here. All right. See, we got our king. Let's see what can happen here. What could our king do? What could our pawn do? Let's look and see what our bishop could do. And it's a little bit easier than the rest of them, thinking a little different. So our bishop actually slid here, 
then boom, that king is in check. And because the king can't put himself in check, that means that there is no more moves and boom, he's in checkmate. So the answer is bishop to c7, okay? Bishop to c7. Now I've got some others on here, but we're actually going to watch a video instead. I hope you enjoyed that. That's usually the highlight of our class. I'll finish up with got two more videos to show. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer it. And then we'll finish up and wrap up class. Okay. So this next one I want to show, oh, I want to talk about the clocks. Okay. So if we look at our handout, we actually talk about how to play uh, chess with tournament rules, okay? Many tournaments follow a set of co uh, common similar rules. These rules do not necessarily apply to play at home or online, but you may want to practice anyway. Touch moves, if a player touches one of their own pieces, they must move that chess, um, that piece, as long as it is a legal move. If a player touches an opponent's piece, they must capture that piece. A player who wishes to touch a piece only to adjust it on the board must first announce the intention, usually by saying adjust. Clock and timers, so this is a big one that we do with our clock, our our online, excuse me, our little um, chess tournaments will, of course, use our clocks and timers. Most tournaments use timers to regulate the time spent on each game, not one each, not on each move. Each player gets the same amount of time to use for their entire game and can decide how to spend the time. Once a player makes a move, then he or she touches a button on and hits a lever to start the opponent's clock. If a player runs out of time and the opponent calls the time, then the player who, who ran out of time loses the game unless the opponent does not have enough pieces to checkmate, in which the case it is a draw. Okay. So let me show a video real quick. So this is about blitz chess and also using our clocks. Hello, this is David Sullivan from Chess NYC again. Today I'd like to talk to you about blitz chess and use of a chess clock. Most serious games of chess are timed and actually that's a really good thing. I think a lot of people are under the impression that chess is an extremely slow game when actually it often is an extremely fast game. One popular form of the game is called uh, five minute blitz. On the clock face, each side has, it says five minutes. There's a button that corresponds to each side of the clock. When one person moves, they move, and with the same hand that they touch the piece, they touch their side of the clock. When they touch their side of the clock, their own time stops and their opponent's time starts. Then their opponent makes a move and touches the clock. And you keep making moves and hitting the clock until either one side wins the game, there's a checkmate or a draw result, or somebody runs out of time on the clock. If you run out of time on the clock, you lose. My personal addiction uh, is one minute blitz on the internet. In fact, a friend of mine calls that video chess crack, where you, you play you play, uh, each side has one minute to make every move in the whole game, so that's the entire game of chess will last less than two minutes. You're packing the whole thing into less than two minutes, and it produces a thrill, which is unusual, and, and it's so addictive, that's why he calls it uh, what I called it. It's the best game in the world. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna start finishing up class here, and unless I have, uh, any questions? Good, wonderful.
Great, wonderful having you here. All right, so let's finish up with our last video here. Uh, you may or may not know about um, Magnus. Magnus is one of the younger players, and he actually has five tips for us. And then we'll kind of wrap class up and stuff. Hello again, chess.com community. Um, here are my five best tips uh, for uh, chess beginners. First of all, uh, play as much chess as possible. Uh, playing really is the best form of training. Uh, that's the way you develop um, your uh, instincts, both uh, positional and, uh, and tactical. So any playing training is good. Longer games, blitz games against computers, against other humans. Secondly, um, reading. Whether it's uh, books or uh, content on the internet, like uh, videos, watch, watching those, uh, it it helps to uh, it helps a lot uh, to 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 read about chess just because um, you like it just because uh, you find it uh, interesting and um, in the long run um, it will be very uh, helpful. Uh, number three, uh, learn uh, the basic mating techniques uh, like mating with a queen and a rook uh, or uh, two rooks uh, and um, queen against um, just the king or uh, also rook against the king. It, it's very uh, useful useful to know. It gives you a lot of confidence uh, to um, uh, that you can that you can uh, finish the game off with uh, with a mate because often uh, in, in especially in games with beginners you can play very well. You can reach a winning position with many uh, pieces up, but it's sometimes hard to checkmate the um, opponent. And you see in games even at um, the very top level, uh, the mating techniques of um, two rooks against um, uh, a king, and also the mating technique of king and, ro and rook against just a king, they are um, very uh, useful in many end games. Number four, um, learn from the old masters. Um, throughout my career I, I feel that it's been very useful but most of all very interesting to uh, read about how chess has developed over over the years and uh, to to look at the games um, especially I think the games since um, the Capablanca Aliekin match uh, in in 1927 I think ever since then um, chess has been played at a very high level and uh, you can learn a lot from all of the great masters. Um, plus, of course, again, if you're uh, as interested in chess as I am, you will find it very interesting just to read about it. And uh, lastly, uh, but most importantly, have fun. Chess training, uh, practicing, it should be all about having fun. If you find uh, playing uh, long games, if you find playing quick games, if you find uh, solving exercises, um, uh, reading chess books, uh, watching videos, if you find all of this very interesting and fun, uh, you will come a long way. Well, thank you. I thought that was some really good tips there, of course. So as we kind of wrap up class and stuff, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Let me get out of that. I hope you enjoyed class and learned something new as well. I guess I need to turn my light on. There we go. You can turn the light on. So uh, glad that you came today. Let me tell you about some of our other classes that we have coming up as well. And then I'll bid you adieu. So we have a list of our classes that we did throughout the month of January. We're actually going to have our new list of classes coming out uh, probably tomorrow afternoon or be Friday. So keep an eye out for that. We did a photography basics class here that's still up available here on our YouTube channel. Of course, let's talk about Libby 
is available there as well, and a few classes on cord cutting, which are on the individual library's uh, Facebook pages as well. Uh, tomorrow we're actually doing a fun class. Come join me in my kitchen on the Grove Town uh, Library website at 11 Facebook page at 11 o'clock. I'll be doing an Instapot class talking about different techniques, some basic food skills, and of course cooking using an Instapot. And then at 2.30, I'll still be in my kitchen and we'll be talking about one of my new gadgets, which is our air fryer, which will be on the Columbia County Library's Facebook page. So come join me for that. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Wish I had some samples after the food I make. But you can, of course, follow along at home and stuff, and hopefully it'll be pretty fun too. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'll throw out there too. Just remember our libraries are open with limited service and hours. Curbside holds pickup is available. You can go to gchrl.org for details or call in the library with questions Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates. We're having our subscribe drive, so please hit subscribe. We're trying to reach 100 subscribers so that we can get our own customized YouTube address. Or you can search YouTube for GCHRL videos and it'll pop right up. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'll see you guys next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye <laughs> for now.